Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? We're doing okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay is a good word. Yeah, we'll go with okay. Okay. I like it very much. May I please ask you to tell us your names? Yeah, I, I'm Deb Cake Fortin. And I'm John Gregory Vincent. Okay. And may I ask each of you to share a little bit about yourself, something you feel comfortable with others knowing or, or learning about you. And it could be some simply as your education, your experience in diversity, your work, your career, whatever you want to talk about, all yours. Okay, sounds good. Um, I was in corporate America for 20 years running a variety of businesses from organizations like the Hartford, the Travelers, um, and my, the, last, um, the, the last stop was really at ADP. And along with running businesses, my passion was really around sort of the social aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So if I got to divisions in, in organizations and they didn't have a diversity program, or I, I really didn't think it was working very well, mm -hmm. I would go in and I would sort of remake, evolve those programs so that they were more effective, so that we weren't just focused on you know, uh, dates on the calendar, but we're really focused on the, the point of diversity and inclusion. Along the way, I started writing for a diversity and inclusion magazine. I would write articles for them. And one year they came to me and asked me to speak at their an annual conference. And I said, I would, but John at the time was with Gallup and he was speaking all over the world. And I said, well, what if we, what if I write the speech and John actually conducts it? He's quite frankly, one of the best speakers I've ever heard. And they were you know, excited about getting him to, to, um, to speak at the conference. So I um, did that, wrote the speech. And you know, part, part of the mystery of this was uncovering this five part system on submarines that drives inclusion. Um, this five part system on, on submarines is something that we talked about at the, at the conference. Mm -hmm. And the reaction was incredible. People were coming up to us. They were you know, asking us if we were training on this anywhere. They were asking us how they could leverage this five part system. And you could tell this was um, in 2016 and a lot had sort of happened culturally in the United States in 2016. And you could tell that people were hungry for things that brought us together rather than divide us. So uh, it was it was very, very exciting. I got out, we got out to the car and I said to John, we have to do something about this. People are too hungry for this. And this is really what my passion is. So I left corporate America, started to write a book, finished the book um, the next year and immediately became a bestseller right away. And people began to call us and ask us what we were doing to help implement this five-part system in, in organizations. So that's what we've been doing since. And I've never done anything more gratifying. Even with all the risk associated with it, I've never done anything more gratifying. So that's me and that's some of my background and it's what gets me up every day. Excellent, thank you very much. Hey. Hi. You can see a long time no chat. How you been? You look good. Thank you so much. As do the both of you. Uh, you know, it's amazing when time goes by, you kind of lose some of those things. But hey, we always find our way back, right? <laughs> as long as the lighting's right, you can get away with almost anything. Exactly. So um, I, again, John Kirby Vincent, my background, literally the background, uh, I'm a retired Navy Command Master Chief. I, I spent most of my time on submarines, uh, then went into the, the private sector. I started with CBS affiliate tele television stations, wound up opening a um, a training and consulting firm that specialized in middle management mm -hmm. training and then had the opportunity of a lifetime to go and be a global consultant for Gallup, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, of course I said yes. So I sort of suspended the company, went to work uh, for Gallup. And I, I, I realized all the time, Rochelle, it, when, when I started working in corporate America, you know, you leave the military and they talk, oh, wait till you get to corporate America. You know, the, the, the military is this bastion of waste and you spend $500 on a hammer and you don't. And I, quite frankly, was pretty terrified by what I saw in corporate America. There was no real training. There was no real preparation for management. There was all of those things that we, we all know collectively. And I went, wow, we did things a lot better on submarines. Yeah. Um, so when I got into management, I just started managing like it was a submarine crew. I didn't know much about television, but I knew a lot about managing people mm -hmm. and things went really, really well. Uh, and um, 
because of that, that's what led me to, to, uh, to go out and, and start the company. And then I moved to Gallup and got to bring a lot of these techniques to Gallup. At, at the root of it, Rochelle, is essentially a belief, I, I think we have it wrong. And this was sort of the basis of, of the speech. We look at diversity and inclusion from the point of view of it's the right thing to do, which of course it is. Mm -hmm. But looking at it from a human behavioral point of view and mindset point of view, which is my Gallup expertise and just my experience in how do you get a bunch of 20 year olds that don't really like each other very much in a tube underneath the ocean for months at a time and they don't kill each other. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. And that's the brilliance of what Deb unpacked was there's an actual system in how, to, in how to do that. And we believe that equity and inclusion is actually a business strategy. It's a way to get when you value people and people feel valued and people feel needed, not because you tell them, but because you demonstrate it and you're tapping into their uniqueness and you're tapping into their talent, by definition, they wanna rise up. And then when you start putting this piece with this piece, what we call interdependent collaboration, now you're really driving inclusion. It's no longer theoretical, it's actually a business strategy and a business model that you can apply. Equity, inclusion, and we believe once you have that culture, you really have this beautiful foundation to drive effective diversity. So my background is sort of this eclectic blend of Gallup consulting, maybe, maybe enlisted guy, uh, and, and then just uh, learning what I've learned from Deb, corporate America and my little stop by corporate America. And at the end of the day, I'll, I'll just echo uh, Deb's point. It's the most rewarding work we've done because we're really, really everything from police departments to communities, to universities, to small and large businesses. We're really ha ha helping people have tangible tools to take what we believe is critical to every aspect of an organization, which is a belief in a culture of equity and inclusion mm -hmm. in order to embrace diversity. And but we're driving in a very practical way, a very pragmatic way, not aspirational, practical. So kind of more about what we do than me, but that's okay. What we do is more interesting than me anyway, so what the heck. <laughs> they're all woven together. Yeah, they're all woven together. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for that. So let me start by asking both of you this question. How do you define diversity? How do you define inclusion? What, what, what are, the, what are the, the key points, pain points, whatever you want to say that, that defines the, those two words for you? Well, in our book, we talk about diversity being the mix and inclusion is making the mix work. And then equity is the, is the engine of talent and talent the engine of equity. So it's really appreciating each individual for what they bring to the table and going, going above and beyond just inclusion to really embracing what those people bring. So that's, that's how I would describe all of those things. We don't talk a lot about equity in our, in our first book, but it's critically important. Um, I just felt like that was too large of a focus that we really needed to focus on diversity and inclusion first, and then get people then to, to uh, wrap their heads around the idea of equity because it's equally critical. Yeah, and, and to expand on that a bit, uh, we, we believe diversity goes way beyond protected class. That, that you're really selling someone short when you just look at what they look like. Um, because the beauty of us is how unique we are at a cellular level. Because of the way you were raised and because of your life experiences, it's so, so selling a person short when you say, oh, okay, let's put people in these five or six little areas. So diversity is this beautiful, very, very broad, to Deb's point, the mix. But just the mix doesn't get you a properly baked cake. You have well, to it doesn't have, get you inclusion. It does, yeah. yeah you, you have to have an intentionality around equity and inclusion. And specifically, Michelle, our definition of inclusion is interdependent collaboration. Mm -hmm. That is our definition of inclusion. Here's why we add a lot of people would say, oh yeah, collaboration, that's all part of that's all part of inclusion. They're missing an important first step. And that's this. When we're under pressure, or we don't know each other very well, or we have biases, there's a whole bunch of reasons for us not to be collaborative. Okay. However, once I get to know your uniqueness, your expertise, your real, real high level of talent, and I realize, you know what, I can struggle with this and turn out something okay, or I can partner with Rochelle and really hit it out of the park. Now I don't, you know, maybe we don't go out for drinks after work. You're not my best pal, but I now 
see that you have value to myself, to my team, and to those around you. Once you establish interdependence, you drive collaboration. That's the definition of inclusion, but you have to have equity first. You have to understand people's talents and their values. And then equity plus inclusion goes, that makes that mix work of diversity. So it's a beautiful thank thing. Thank you for that. But let, let me ask you a question, devil's advocate here. So um, in what we recognize as corporate America, uh, nonprofit organizations, all of these things, there is not a great deal of diversity. And even using the definitions you use, which are very different from mine, to me, diversity is actions, ideas, persons, and thoughts combined. You cannot have one without the other. So if you're only going with someone because of their skin tone or their gender, I think you're selling it short. So if you don't have diverse ideas, if you don't have diverse actions, and if you don't have diverse thoughts about your next steps forward, you can't get past you know, to inclusion and equity and all those other things. So that's, that's my definition. But let me ask you this, as you look at the world around you, let's just start in corporate America. So Silicon Valley, which is, you know, my area of expertise, is probably one of the least diverse organizations or areas in the United States, right? So you have these top Fortune 500 technology companies, and we won't mention any names, but if you look at their data, their track record, they don't hire very many people of color. They don't promote very many women into leadership roles. So there's all of these little crevices that we, we think we're, 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 we're sealing up. But in reality, we still have this fissure between what we understand about humankind. So I'm a Black woman. And so all of these stereotypes has been lumped onto me, meets me when I walk in the front door, right? So... I'm an angry black woman, you know, I'm promiscuous and whatever else the world says that I am, that's it. And so me as a black woman, I spend most of my career fighting to unprove those things are true. So with corporate America still struggling with this, education struggling with this, nonprofit struggling with this, how, haven't, how come we haven't made enough progress in the diversity space to actually see results? And, and, and it was really amazing when you talked about law enforcement, because a lot of my friends are in law enforcement or judges or whatever. So I have a lot of you know, important people that I know. And I ask this question all the time, like, how can you not recognize difference by skin, but not by genealogy, you know, not by our, 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 our genetics? Our, you know, we, we may have five or six different genetics that make you have blue eyes or brown eyes or blonde hair or brown hair. I mean, blue eyes or brown hair and blue eye, brown eyes and brown hair. But that's really about as deep as it goes to the differences between people, regardless of their race, gender, you know, all of that stuff. So why does, why does this problem persist? Yeah, actually, that's an excellent question. I, I, I know you have the answer, so I'll let you start and yeah. I'll contribute. And, and like we said earlier, and you just said, we, we sell diversity ridiculously short when we just look at it from what we look like. It's much deeper than that. It's absolutely much deeper than that. So we actually really agree with your definition. Yeah, we actually I, agree. I mean, we might yeah. use different words, but the overall arching, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we have way too narrow. Here's why it's failed. This, it's actually how I started, I started the speech that Deb wrote, and it sort of took the oxygen out of the room, and then it put the oxygen back in the room, and it was simply this. This was an equity, this was a diversity and inclusion conference, right? So we had 500 people here that were all in on this topic. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm gonna loosely tie this. It's actually not technically correct, but for the sake of this, of this speech, let's tie this to the civil rights movement. We've been saying that diversity and inclusion is the most important thing. Diversity and inclusion is something we have to embrace. Diversity, we've been saying this over and over and over again, and the companies have initiatives and they have this and they have that and they do this. Well, then how is it 70 years into this grand experiment, and this was about four years ago, 96% of Fortune 500 CEOs are white guys like me. Yeah. And everybody kind of went, oh, okay. He sort of went there right away, but it's true. I mean, we celebrate, I think it was two years ago that the Congress gets to 20% women. And we're like, wow, that's amazing. The 52% of the population, it's pathetic. Right. Here's the problem. We have always approached diversity, equity and inclusion. We have always approached it as the right thing to do, which of course it is. But I'm telling you, the right thing to do doesn't change. You wanna change a company, you gotta make an appeal to a bottom line. 
you have to show that there is an ROI to right. diversity. Yep. And that makes a lot of people very uncomfortable, but it doesn't make us uncomfortable because we know it's true. Absolutely. When you show that it is in your best interest to have a diverse workforce, it is in your best interest to value each individual, it is in your best interest to understand people well enough to put them together in the right teams. They will overproduce, they will innovate, you will have less turnover. This is a business strategy. Once you do that, and oh, by the way, it's a business strategy when we work with law enforcement. We don't do this to keep you out of jail or keep you from lawsuit. We do this because you know what? If you have a better relationship with the community, this is good for everyone. This isn't a this isn't a, a something to do to get people from not suing you. This is something to do because it's a better way of doing business. So even in law enforcement, we approve it as a business strategy. And I'll, I'll take it one step further. If you're not providing people with tangible tools yeah. that they can use to drive that ROI, whether it's ROI in a in a police force, which is different from a corporation, then then they really don't know how to do it. It's it's words, it's will, it's uh, a lot of really positive things, but it's not really tangible tools. Yeah. So uh, along the way, we were able to prove that this five-part system actually works to drive uh, better inclusion. And we, we got a published patent on it because it actually is something that's tangible that really works. And that's the bottom line. If you can't show, especially in, in, in America, because we're very, very focused on the benefit of what we do and, and monetizing the benefit of what we do. If you can't monetize it, then it's not going to stick and it's not going to stay stuck. Um, but, so. but, but, but do you not see in your work and in, in what you do that what we consider ourselves as human, mm -hmm. we always assign a value to it, better, worse, superior, inferior, good, bad. And so I had a chat with someone yesterday and we were talking about, so I work in IT, I've been in IT 40 plus years. So there are all these terms in IT that are just downright racist. So you have master slave, right? So you 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 slave a server to a, another server, or you slave storage, to whatever it is. So this, this, a common term. And I would say, you know, having worked for the Department of Defense a long time ago, when they were thinking about developing this technology, I don't think they had this this thought. Oh, we're we're trying to you know pinpoint or hurt people with slavery. But then you come into here we are in the twenty. 20th century, 21st century, terms like blacklisted and whitelisted. So if a company blacklists your website, you can't connect to that website. Whereas if you whitelist it, you can run all over the place, right? So there are all of these terms, and I'll give you one for you, you know, manpower and man hours. All of these terms are very much in our society. We don't think anything wrong with them. We don't, we don't condemn them when we hear them. We accept that this is you know, the words that we use to define something, right? So how do you accomplish your mission when we as people at the very heart of who we are tend to be some level of prejudice or biased? You know, we tend to be um, believing on these traditions we've had all of our lives, you know? So, you know, I, I, I am a huge African, I mean, American history person. And so I was listening to Nixon in his own words the other day. And he describes the difference between Mexicans, Mexican-Americans and Negroes. And here's what he says. Well, Haldeman says this. Haldeman said, Mexicans in Mexico are good, moral, hardworking people. But the ones in America are like, you know, slow. They don't you know, produced, they're just, you know, violent, all these other things. And then Nixon chimes in and says, well, at least they're not like the Negroes because the Negroes live like dogs. And so we, this is now, you know, in the 70s. So of course we can, we can make whatever judgment we want about this. And then we did in 2016, the exact same thing again. We almost elected the exact same president who had the exact same mindset and all of that. So where, how do you overcome what we believe about race and gender and sexual orientation and religion. How do we overcome all of those masterful things that are rooted so deep into the fabric of America that we can actually apply diversity and equity and inclusion? You give them something else to focus on. And uh, we call it talent. 
And if you're really thinking about the fact that every individual has a talent that they can contribute, and you can tap into that talent and you can get people to think about talent, then those stereotypes have absolutely no, they have no meaning and they begin to fall away. But I think you really have to get people thinking about what talent is, why it's important, and the fact that every individual has a talent that they can contribute. And I'm sure you have something there. No, I, I also think you have to have uncomfortable conversations. Absolutely. I think you have to bring these things up. And for too long, it's been like, oh, well, you know, big fans, but we don't really want to go there. Well, you have to go there. If you never go there, you never go there. And you have to go there and you have to bring these things up and say, you know, why do we use these terms? Why do we look at things this way? You know, I think you have to challenge those norms. But if, if, if we leave it at, let's be aware of our unconscious bias, and I'm not trashing unconscious bias, it's great to be aware of that, but then I'm, I'm always left with, okay, great, now what? What, so, so, so what? And, and the so what is to Deb's point. If you replace that, I'll tell you exactly how a submarine works. And this is the poster child of a potentially a racial powder keg. You have people on submarines that have literally never had a conversation with a black person. Maybe in basic training, they had to have some interaction, but pretty much you're just getting yelled at for eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And now you're literally sharing a bed. Now, if somebody thinks there's some magic dust like there are in the movies, oh no, this is a conflict-ridden environment. Why does it work? It works for Shaw for one simple reason. I need this person. This person has value. They have value for their knowledge. They have value for what they contribute. And okay, yeah, the black thing's a little uncomfortable for me. Let's have a conversation. Let's work through it. So you talk about the uncomfortable. But it's really the value, the talent that Deb's talking about that really starts breaking things down. Now you start really bringing that interdependence. Now you start bringing that collaboration. And people that literally, at the very best, would stay on opposite sides of the street, and sometimes, unfortunately, not stay on opposite sides of the street, and conflict would arise, are now, I don't know if they're best of friends, but they're working together, and it's no big deal. But it's not because they're not pretending that person's not black or that person's not gay or that. No, no, no. Talk about it. Open it up. But what, what, what really drives this is understanding the value of the person. We call it the virtual cup of coffee. If I don't know you, I can judge the poo out of you. But most people, and there's always exceptions because we've just got some nutties out there, but most people, once you sit down and have that cup of coffee and start understanding who that person is, all that stuff starts breaking down and it starts getting replaced with other things like contribution and talent. And this person can make my life better or they can help me in my work or they can help me at home or they can help me in other things. So you have to have the uncomfortable conversations and then you have to focus on what Deb said, the talent and the unique value of people but you can't do one without the other. I think I agree with that. I, I, what, what I still struggle with is if you look at statistically how we define people, you know, so someone you know went to Harvard and someone you know went to a historically black college, that's a bright red line in the sand. So if I'm getting ready to hire for a position where I really need top talent, who am I gonna hire? probably that Harvard guy, not that person who went to the historically black college, because in our mindset, and this has been happening forever, I'm sure you both have heard of the bell curve and there are continuous research studies that talk about the intellectual inferiority of black and brown people compared to white and Asian people, right? So there's this thing that is ingrained in us. And if you go into any public school, especially at the very early ages, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, you see it so blatantly that it's almost shocking. A woman wrote a book said, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? So if you've listened to any of my chats, especially the early ones, I did with a lot of students uh, that go to predominantly white colleges. And there's not been a single one of them that said, I felt like I belonged. I felt like the university cared about what happened to me. I felt like I was a part of a community, but, but the actual reverse, like you're taking a seat from a white person who could have this job. Are you smart enough to be in this class with me? You know, why are you here? And so those years of piling that gunk on top of people about whether we're intellectually inferior because of our race or emotionally unstable because of our gender, 
it's so ingrained in how we see each other and how we believe things. Because if you heard what I said, I am always the angry black woman. And that's so far from the truth because I'm an introvert. You know, I prefer not to talk. You know, I don't, don't want to go engage. I don't want to have conflict. But I also am not going to let you talk to me anyway. I'm not going to let you treat me anyway. You know, when you're doing something indifferent to me, I'm going to raise it for you, you know? And so I'll give you my one good example. So uh, my, uh, my, in my last job, I had a colleague, he's, he's, he's a white guy. I call him my brother from another mother because I absolutely love everything about this man. He's brilliant. Um, so he and I established a really great bond. Now, taking into what you said, John, I mean, like recognizing the talent, he saw what I was good at. I saw what he was good at. And we were able to move forward. But those who employed both of us saw him as a talented white man. And at, he started six or seven months after I did. So they paid me like $82,000, $83,000. They paid him $121,000. Less education, less experience, less everything. But we didn't let that corrupt our, our relationship. We, we put that aside. We said, okay, yeah. we're not gonna deal with that. But I was constantly pushing. Why can't I be paid more? Why can't I be paid more? And, and you know, there are these, these words. And so language is such an amazing thing because it empowers us and it actually discourages us at the exact same time. So what you do is the front end of technology. And what he does is the back end of technology. So using those dividing things, they justify why they can pay me less. And I'm sure you both know that women still make, I don't care what color the woman is, make less than a man, specifically a white man in most jobs. So these hurdles that exist in the space, and I don't even like to say diversity, but just in social justice are so high to overcome. And the work that you guys are doing, you know, you're going, you know, to individual, but I, I really think it has to have happen at a national level so people get it, because I think your points are spot on. You know, if you recognize the talent somebody has, it shouldn't make any difference to what color they are. But there's this thing of, you know, am I comfortable with you? So homo social reproduction, I prefer to be with people who look like me, who think like me, who share my values, right? So if I happen to make the off color joke, the person that does not have my values may be offended or may think something about me. Whereas if I make it with the guy who I play golf with every Sunday, he's gonna laugh and chuckle just like I just did. So these, these hurdles that we have seem to be, you know, you can root it out in a company, you know, with, with, with the tools that you guys just described, but how do you root it out of a larger society? Well, I think you have to start earlier. Um, I would say some of the most rewarding work we do is with children. Yeah. It's with uh, college students. It's with minds that are still pliable and open and receptive to thinking a different way. And you can overcome a lot by getting to people very early and you need to get to as many people as possible, uh, as early as possible to make those changes. But it's, it's still even possible in college, even if a lot of these notions aren't introduced until college, college students by their nature are, are usually more open to new ideas and they're used to uh, input from a lot of different kinds of sources and you can begin to make some real inroads if you start early. I mean, it's just us and a few people. Um, we have you know, half a dozen different affiliates that we have trained and some, some other folks. So we're trying to get to as many people as possible to open up those minds. But I would say some of our favorite work is definitely with, um, it's with police forces where we really feel like we can open up their minds to a different way of interacting with the community and with, um, with schools and, and uh, universities. Yeah, high, high schools and, and, and college level. You know, it's it's an interesting thing, Rochelle, because if you look at this, and that's why- And with teachers. Uh, we work a lot with teachers. Uh, that, that's why this is, a, this is a long-term commitment to get to where you're going, but it's not an impossible commitment because we are not wired to be racist. We are not wired. If you think about it, if you just leave five five-year-olds together you bring them to the playground right we're not we're not wired to go i ain't hanging out with her i ain't hanging out with it. it's like hey man you want to play in the sand all good these are all learned behaviors 
So by definition, I'm, you know, again, now I'm going back to my Gallup science, you know, we all jump to changing behavior. No, 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 no. Just like you have to be interdependent if you really want to be collaborative, you got to be interdependent first. I have to see the value in you. Oh, that's not fair. You should take me at face value. It, it is what it is. It's how we're wired as humans. The same thing applies uh, here, which is we learn these behaviors. So first you have to change mindset. Well, the younger you get to, per, to, to a person, the less mindset you have to change before you get to the behavioral change. If you go back to a five-year-old, there's no mindset to change at all. You just have to keep reinforcing it. Take people at true value, take people at what they bring. So what we're doing here is you're talking about a fundamental rewiring. And you've said it very eloquently. I mean, hundreds of years, and I'm just using, I mean, it's, it's thousands of years, but I'm just simply using sort of something people can get their head around. Well, you can teach an old dog new tricks. So I don't think that's a lost cause, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be onesie twosies. It's gonna be less effective. The younger you can get to people and reinforce what most young people already believe and tell them that's not a kooky way of thinking. It's a normal way of thinking. Then the more effective you will be. That's how you start transforming. And I understand people go great. Hitting the 17 and 18 year olds, what are we talking another 20, 30 years? Hey, how long have we been at this? And how are we doing? It's We're not doing investment. well. It's <laughs> worth the investment. So why not start tomorrow? And in 15 years, these people are making the decisions and they're going, of course, I'm making decisions this way. What are the way is there? So I think the biggest bang for the buck is to invest young, but you never give up 50, 60, 70s because we've seen massive transformations. I can think of one city, I can't use the name, but this was not the most progressive place in the world in the South. They have completely transformed their organization in the, in the last three years. City manager, assistant city manager, economic development, all women, all people of color, that would never even been a concept. They weren't overtly racist. They were just comfortable with the white guys at the table. Once we taught them that there was another way to look, so it's not just that the best, most effective is what Deb said, the younger, the better, but you don't give up on the present either, but it's gotta be practical. It's gotta yeah. be applicable. It's gotta be a business strategy. It can't be aspirational. So I'll, I'll give you this, and I, I want you to just dissect this for me. So on the last Thursday of every November, we have a, an event. We call it Thanksgiving. It's a tradition. We have been having Thanksgiving since the Native Americans and the colonists joined together wherever, and somebody decided we should have a holiday to give thanks, right? It's a tradition that is so rooted in us, we don't even know what to do. So in the middle of a pandemic, People can't go see their families. You know, they're telling you to only be with people you live with, you know, so you got all these things. And a lot of people are struggling with that. So I was watching the news last night. And I saw that um, uh, in New York uh, that there were a million people a day going to the TSA, the, the um, authority there in the airport, a million people a day, knowing that we have 300,000 people dead. And yet still, I've got to go to grandma's house. Or I've got to go see my aunt. I've got to go see my father. I've got to go whoever I need to go see. Because inherently in us, we believe in that tradition that we created so many years ago. And so we have to practice it. And, and I would challenge you this way. So I grew up in South Carolina, rural part of South Carolina, 27 miles from Charleston, the boonies, the sticks. And there was, you know, the mom and pop store there. And there'd be four or five white men sitting on the porch with their pipes or chewing tobacco and they'd be spitting it out. You know, a black man comes into the store, walks by the store, hey boy, you see me here? Yeah, okay. So this is a grown man. Now it's not a boy, it's a grown man. See here, you know, but that's still. Or someone would say to me, you're pretty cute for an inn. You know, you know, those kinds of things. So here we are, where we are in the 21st century. And so I have two children, uh, 20 years apart. And one child still remembers the entire stigma of what it is to be black in America. I mean, you know, every time you see it, you can point it out and say, there it is, right? You can point it out and say, there, this happened. Whereas the younger one doesn't have that. He does not, you know, identify or you know, prefer one group or another, or think about, you know, the, the injustices that happen in society, because he's a gamer. And I guess you're playing in this anonymous space where nobody sees you and you don't see anybody else. And, you know, you might talk and maybe you can elicit from that, whether the person is of a certain uh, ethnicity, but for the most part, you know, what you said, John, I think so perfect. I think you did as well, but you know, they have, they, they create a team of players who, you know, 
work on their expertise to get better every time because there's money involved with it. So I don't really know all this about gaming, but whatever my son tells me, you know. So, that, so these people of diverse backgrounds come together without your gender, your race, your religion, your name, anything else, but just for the sake of winning a game. Now, if we could pick that model up and apply it to every part of life, that would be great. Is it because he's younger? I do not know. He grew up, he knows all of my relatives. He knows my husband's relatives. So he has a, a real good foundation of what racism looks like and he's seen it, but he didn't buy into it. He did not say, I'm gonna put that cloak on and I recognize that there are people who are racist. What he said is he recognized that people are flawed, which I thought was brilliant for a 20 year old. You know, I was sitting there applauding. I'm like, congratulations. I didn't get that far when I was that young. It took me a long time to get here, you know, but, but I think to me, your work and my work, we work in the exact same space. I have a full-time job, but my, my work is really in advocacy for black and brown people and women. That's where my, my work is. That's where my passion is, is what I love. And I, I'm a paid public speaker. I speak in a lot of places, I'm, I'm requested. But my question always is the exact same. We can talk all we want to. Let me see what you're going to do. So, you know, there was an article in the Washington Post in 2017 by a white professor. I think she was at Georgetown and she says, why don't we have more black and brown professors in higher education? And the, and, and, and the tagline was so simple because we don't want them. You know, so those, those, those traditions that we understand to be factual. And I'll, I'll give you one more example and then I'll, I'll finish my question. So in 2015, Google released this facial recognition software. Brilliant. It was the first step in biometrics from a big company who had great ideas. So whenever it saw someone like the two of you, it produced an image or something. But when it saw a person like me, it produced a gorilla. And I talk about this a lot. I tell people, there is no way Google did that intentionally. It's bad for their business. They would never have done that intentionally. But when you have the people that are developing these codes, creating these systems, doing all this work, and they all look alike, that's the outcome you're going to have. And this is not like we're talking 10 or 15. This is five years ago, well, maybe a little bit more than five, but five years ago, we were still struggling with this. And here we are today, and in the work you do with law enforcement, algorithms are now biased, right? So if you live in a certain zip code where it's high crime, low poverty, all, low education, it's more expensive. You know, if you want to get car insurance, you want to loan or something, it's more expensive. So with all of those things that we believe to be true, whether they are or not, why hasn't the larger society seen what you guys are preaching? You know, that it's value in bringing people of different kinds of environments together to see the talent that they have and not just to see someone because of their race, their age, their gender, or their sexual orientation, even religion. Why, why, why haven't we gotten there? Well, there, what you're really talking about is systems that help maintain it, right? Absolutely. So, so the question really is, which changes first? Yeah. Do you do you change to a more talent-based mindset where people are appreciated for their talents, and then you unravel the systems, or do you unravel the systems first, and then allow a different way of thinking? And I, we don't have the answer to that question, but we do what we can control. Yeah. And what we can control is getting people to think from. Uh, an open mind about talent and about people and the value of people. Yeah. And then, uh, then the systems need to be unraveled. Those right. systems that help maintain uh, racism or gender bias or, um, uh, or uh, stereotypes of any kind need to all be unraveled. But if someone says there are systemic issues, Absolutely, there are. And every day we create a new one, Absolutely. you know, with, yeah. the more we have technology, the more we create new ones. Absolutely. And those need to be unraveled. But I, I think we do what we can in, in our world. And we're both, you know, behavior modification um, proponents, which means we have to change people's behavior. We need to give them tangible tools to change that behavior. And we need to help organizations measure how the benefit of that so that we can repeat that over and over again with the different businesses that we touch. 
and yeah. that's what we do. And and what I would add to but that, but you have a very unique view into because of the the business that you're in, you have a very unique view into this that I don't think about every day. But you're absolutely right. Uh, those those things are issues, and they keep they keep the bad stuff in place. Absolutely. What what I would what I would add to what Deb said, and this goes back to younger, you know, reinforcing your son, reinforcing the younger mindset, which again is fairly open to these things. The same thing applies to do you try to do something nationally or do you try to do something locally? Well, look at the history, not of the United States, of the world. All change starts local. All change starts local. We're counting on those clowns in, in, in DC to fix any of this, we're already in trouble. I'll look at where we live in Augusta, Georgia, and a good friend of ours- Although we need their support because they drive legislation that drives change, so. Yes, but it changes locally. Um, in, in Augusta, a, a good friend of ours, one of our, one of our um, associates in our, in our company is the former mayor of Augusta. And he spearheaded in an area that has been low income housing since the beginning of time. He said, here's a crazy idea. Why don't we do a public private blend? Why don't we do a mixed income model where someone who makes $120,000 is living in the same townhouses as someone who makes $28,000. Oh my God, it'll be all oh, horrible. They'll be murdered, they'll be stabbed, they'll be, and how are we gonna pay for this? Well, what if we were to add a dollar to the accommodation tax? Anyway, a long story to basically say, what we have in Augusta, is now a model, a mixed income model in a place that used to be a really, really quote unquote bad section of town. It's not a bad section of town. And you know what? We didn't displace anybody. We just made it more, more inclusive and we made it fair so that people who don't have the income could pay one, one thing for their home and other people could pay another thing for their home and they live side by side. We're back to the virtual cup of coffee. And you know what? Rochelle's kind of cool, she's funny. All of a sudden, I'm not paying so much attention to what Michelle does for a living or if she went to the Wharton School or not, or all of that other stuff. It, local is huge. We have to do what we can, to Deb's point, locally. Act locally. And if you just change the way your local churches, your local government has a view of, low, uh, of, of um, opportunity zones or has a view of community policing, if you do that, that's typically how things start to spread. Deb's career, completely correct. Obviously we need funding and we need support and we need big, but I don't know if they ever get around to it. I think it starts locally and it grows locally and then it starts becoming the next thing to do. And then it gets bigger it and bigger and bigger. Movement. It becomes a movement and more people are like, you know, there's three types of folks. There's early adapters. There's let's wait and see how this thing goes and folks that are never gonna get on board. Right. So you start with the early adapters locally, and then those folks that are on the fence, which is the largest group of people or cities or municipalities or politicians go, yeah, I, I, I'm in, and they follow the early adapters. And then you have the other ones that we just need to just kind of put in the fence because they're never going to change. Yeah. It, but you're going to get to 80%. So I think young is wonderful. I think local is the most powerful way to drive change. So... On that point, I, I don't know if I, I agree with that. So if you take, uh, Mr. Floyd was killed on, in, in uh, March. Yes. March. And all of a sudden, all of my white friends and colleagues started having these conversations within their families, right? And, and I'll tell you a little preset to this. So I don't have a Facebook account. When first Facebook first came on and took some, some interest, I had a Facebook account. But growing up in my rural town, I would see these posts you know, a Confederate flag or, you know, die in, die in, you know, so the word D-I-E, the N word, die, you know, and all this stuff. And this is, you know, what, six, seven years ago. So when Mr. Floyd was killed, young people did what they did when Obama was elected president. They came together using social media technology to push a movement forward, you know, so Black Lives Matter. And it's one of those, you know, the, one of those pain point statements, right? Because you get the question of, well, does blue lives not matter? Do not brown lives not matter? Do white lives not matter? And, and no one's willing to dissect what it means when somebody says black lives do not matter. Of all the people in America, the majority of the black people did not come here seeking 
a better way of life. We didn't go through Ellis Island. We didn't, you know, sign up or, you know, we came here by force. We were made to drive the economy of the South. And somewhere along the line, we got into a fight, the Civil War, to undo this. And there are arguments that still occur today, whether the Civil War was about slavery or states' rights. And it kind of constantly clashes with each other, you know, like, so which is which? But, but from where I sit, it's so hard to be Black and successful. It's almost like doing five jobs in the same eight-hour period. Because not only do I have to do my job really well, I have to make sure that I am not doing anything that may trouble my white colleagues, specifically my white male colleagues. Then in, in, in that same vein, women compete with each other. You know, we compete with each other in ways in the workplace that makes absolutely no sense to me. Instead of us lifting each other up and, you know, seeing that someone can grow and you promote them and whatever, nope. You can't succeed if I can't succeed. And we used to call that in South Carolina crabs in the bucket, right? You get one almost up the top, you snatch the other one back down into the pot, you know, that kind of thing. But to be black in America is to not know where you're safe, to not know where you are, to not know how to be in a society that sees you as something other than a human being. And I tell people this all the time. I did a talk uh, in October and everybody in the room was floored by this. I said, the best example of diversity is the universe. If you walk outside your front door, you might find five different species of pine trees, crepe myrtles, magnolias, every different kind of frog and fly, whatever. It's a per and it lives in a perfect balance. But yet we as human beings must have better and worse, light and dark right and wrong, as opposed to understanding that there is something called gray, where it's not either, and it doesn't have any value, whether it's either. So if I can sit here and point out something to you and convince you I'm right, what have I done? Nothing. All I've just done is made myself a hero where you probably see, what the hell is wrong with her? Why does she think that's right? You know, and so I try to tell people, move away from right, move away from thinking that you have to win but to see the perspective of the other person. So if the other person thinks today is Sunday and you think it's Monday, you can go point on a calendar and say, see it right there. Says, so, okay, you're right. What have you done? You just, you know, that person isn't going to buy into you just because you showed them because they believe it's Sunday or it's Sunday, Sunday, somewhere in the world or something like that. So you get these kind of competing things about how we see each other in, in, in the workplace and play and living, you know, so, you both ought to be all old enough to remember redlining. You know, we still have pieces of that that still exist today. And I think your housing example is a very beautiful one. I think that's amazing. But more times than not, like, and I'll give you an example here, here in Durham where I am, you know, we're, you know, divided by zip codes, like I think most cities and towns are. You know, there are certain just uh, uh, zip codes that have high crime, low wage, low poverty. You know, people don't keep up their homes and all that stuff. Got all that. And so, when the tide turned in the 70s and 80s, you had that white flight. They moved out of the city, they moved to the suburbs. And so what was left then were the people who were not able to move out of the suburbs. Well, today we have gentrification, right? So that same house, somebody bought that from a black person who was down on his luck or didn't understand the wealth of real estate. And that house is now a million dollar house in the middle of a poverty stricken neighborhood. And you cannot get people to understand what that means because as black people, we see that as just being pushed further and further into the plantation as opposed to being free. So there are these constructs that are constantly churning in our society that causes us not to know whether we are safe. Am I safe? Can I go to Wyoming? Can I go to Idaho? Can I go to Utah and come back safely? You know, am I as a black person safe in my own country? So when you all apply those things that you talked about, and I think they, they're spot on, but how do you get past that place where we, and I think this is probably applicable to brown people too, aren't sure our value. Because if you looked at, you know, when the uh, people were coming in from all these countries and the president was talking about building a wall and they were putting little kids in cages and separating them from their parents, this is not something that was happening 20 years ago. That happened in the last four years. 
where do we where do we break this cycle so that people feel like they belong and they're not simply labeled or judged by things that are so insignificant because skin color eye color hair color other than gray hair which is absolutely beautiful but other than that you know, there, 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 there's no no thing like that that matters exactly you see all this gray in here right so there's nothing about that that matters but somehow that we put so much emphasis on it that we're almost to the point where that's all we know how to talk about so when mr floyd died all these white friends i have colleagues i had wanted to have this conversation and the first question that i was ever asked was so astounding to me i almost fell down how long has this been happening? Is this just a recent occurrence? Currents? Like, what country are you living in? You know, I mean, they're killing black people every day, all over the place, and not just police officers. You know, just and black people are killing each other. So, you know, this this can't be. Why is this happening now? Why are you just thinking about it now? And a lot of people said it's because of the pandemic. Well, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Well, I I think we tend to live in our own space and in our own world and if it doesn't have something directly to do with me then i don't give that as much attention as i should um i, I think it's why we do what we do because we have this ability to see beyond our lives to other lives and all those other lives matter a lot but I think society tends to, to, to do that. And I don't think it has to do with the pandemic as much as I think um, seeing someone go through what George Floyd did in such a visible way, in such a tragic way. Um, the fact that he called out, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> Or his mother and, you know, tell yeah. him he can't breathe, you know, and his mother's been dead. Yeah, absolutely. Every, I think every woman in America was touched. Yes, absolutely. At least I, I hope so. I hope so too. And I think it became real. To a lot of people, it wouldn't be real. It came home to them. But why? Why did it come home? Because you all remember a gentleman by the name of James Bird. This is yep. in Texas, Texas in the um, late 80s, early mm -hmm. 90s. Somebody strapped him to the back of a pickup truck and drug him till he was decapitated. I mean, yeah. why wasn't that you know, compelling? Why wasn't that something to get people riled up? Why, wh what happened? And I'll, and I'll give you an example, and please don't count, count this as disrespect, but you called him George Floyd. I would never, call, I, don't, I didn't know him. I, I, I don't have any familiarity with him. So he's Mr. Floyd. I, I feel like I owe him that respect because I hadn't had no interaction with him. So I never call him by his first name because like that makes it seem like that I am somehow in his space and I'm not, you know, so I honor him by just saying Mr. Floyd, because that's how I know and what I've heard in the media, what, you know, you saw in the news, but nothing more than that. And that's one of those things that sometimes I think becomes a divisor between people is how we see each other. So you're comfortable enough to call him that and I'm not. I, I can I can meet someone and feel their heart mm -hmm. and they become my friend immediately and they're no longer a stranger to me and and that's my nature. I mean, I'm connected to people that that I probably met. In fact, one one woman I met uh, at the airport and I asked her to join me at the table because there was no room. Mm -hmm. and we got to know each other and we're not best friends but she is my friend and we are still in contact so that's the way I feel about people it's not it's not meant as disrespect it's meant to bring people close um and that felt very close to me for one thing I spent many many years in Minneapolis I know exactly where that happened to him I know that street mm -hmm. where it happened to him and uh, I was dismayed at that that place that I spent so many years that that would happen there. Um, but I would say it's just my nature, and I and I think one thing I've noticed living in the South because I obviously don't come from the South, but you know people here call me Miss Deb, and there's there's a certain respect about how you refer to people here, whereas I go past that to to creating friends and creating relationships right away not to say that that isn't also a way to to create friendship and relationships but it's just it's it's not my nature it's not that i feel 
um, any any disrespect towards him at all. In fact, I would say that it's quite the opposite. Uh, I think that situation has, like I said, brought home, made real a tragedy to a lot of people that it wouldn't have touched. So he has sort of an exalted role in this country. And I think a lot of people are not going to forget that for a long time. And I can't explain why the 1980s, why that, that situation didn't have that same effect, but it was he was the right person at the right time in the country to make a difference. And he won't be forgotten. Yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly it. I certainly can't, you know, there's, there's, there's dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of, of, of high profile examples of this. I, I think in George Floyd's case, that was just so, that could happen to anybody. I think that hit a lot of people in a way. Now, and, and when I say that could happen to anyone, people can relate. I don't mean that there is justice and there is equality, there's not. What I mean by that is we've seen that situation where someone gets stopped. We've seen, that was a familiar surrounding. That was a street to Deb's point. That's what I mean by we can relate to that, not relate to his experience because I can't. But I can relate to that street. I can relate to that environment and go, holy, have we completely lost our mind? It was such a surreal, horrible thing occurring right there that could literally happen anywhere. And it does happen everywhere. But I think the relevance of that horror was something that everyone could touch. And I, and I, and I think that, that that made a sea change in a lot of people. And I'm probably not expressing it exactly right, but I, but I think that had a lot to do with it. It wasn't some distant place that we could write off or that would never happen here or that would, and all the other I, excuses I we've been a, using forever. I think that goes a little to the, you, you make changes at a local level. Y yes, they're, they're now, I, hopefully there is a permanent national awareness of that and it doesn't leave us. But the reality is, that that change needs to happen at a local level. And one of the things that we've been experiencing is uh, mid-sized cities, mid-sized law enforcement reaching out and saying, we really like what we hear about what you're doing. We want you to come in. We want you to work with our law enforcement so that we can permanently make a change. We can permanently help drive relationships yeah. with the community. And we can, we can open up the community, we can open up law enforcement so that there's a better relationship there. Yeah. And that began to happen at a local level. We've had more activity from law enforcement this year. We've worked with law enforcement for about 10 years, but we've had more activity this year than we've had in years. And I think that's what I mean about driving it at, lo at the local level. Mm -hmm. It, the, the, the movement may have happened at a national level, but the change happens at a local level. I mean, I, I don't know that I disagree with that. I just think that, you know, to me, this is not something I see the world in rose color. You know, it's not like one of these things I see that there is a, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel. I, I hope so, but I don't believe in my lifetime and I'm 62 years old. I do not believe in my lifetime the world that we live in will get better for black and brown citizens until we are recognized as human beings. And, and, and I will just tell you this, so, and, and, and again, not meaning any disrespect, but the fact that both of you said George Foreman, um, Flo George Floyd, sorry, wrong man, but George Floyd is white privilege. Because if I were to meet, I don't know who it is, my first, interaction with that person is never going to assume that I am accepted or how I see them or how we correspond is okay. I'm waiting for them to say, okay. So I'll give you an example. So there's a guy that I work with and his name is William. And when I first met him, he said, very nice to meet you, Rochelle, I'm William. And so one of his colleagues was walking by, he said, oh, just call him Bill but he didn't give me that permission to call him Bill. Someone else gave me that permission and I did not bite that apple. He said his name is William, so I'm gonna call him William. And so 
the exceptions that we make are sometimes so skewed that we don't even realize we're making, right? And I think this is true for all people, not white, not, not we, we, we all kind of juxtapose ourselves against what we think versus what we believe and hope, you know? So, you know, white people are prejudiced, racist, you know, slave owners, you know, all of these things that we can attach to white people, you know, wealth, you know, power, prestige, all of these things that you then turn around and look at a black community and you got a handful of people. So you got your Oprahs and Tigers and whoever else who's, who's made it to the stratosphere where their race and their gender doesn't matter so much. Whereas the majority of us are still struggling to find our voice in a society where we are literally voiceless. You know, there's a, um, a HBO special that just came out last week and uh, it says Between the World and Me. And it's a series of people talking about their encounters with law enforcement, talking about their encounters in their own community, talking about, you know, their college. And it's a beautiful story because it tells this from so many people, just regular everyday people, not famous people, but every everyday people who see the world in the, in the way it interacts with them. And then they bring in these high powered actors like Angela Davis talks some, Oprah talks some, the whole bunch of people get on there and talk some, but you know, regular everyday people telling what it means to be black, what it means, how are you seen? What do you assume about me? And so I think that in my mind, there's a part of how we divide ourselves, whether intentionally or not, that one of us always rises to the top and another one of us falls to the bottom. And that's, that seems to be always the case. You know, there is, so if you, when you look at the statistics of your company or you look at the statistics of your work or whatever it is, and I'll tell you from my perspective, in the United States, there are less than 7% women that lead organizations, Fortune 500, big, big, big organizations, small, and this regards to color of the women's skin, women. I put a link in there. There's a diversity chat that was done in 2016 by an Indian woman. And she said there are more men named John than there are women in leadership. And that's a pretty powerful statement. More men named John than there are in leadership. And I said, I'm thinking, my God, that's, 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 that's pretty, pretty, pretty significant. But then to further that, you know, like, so why aren't, and we'll just pick on white women this time. Why aren't there more white women leading? Why can't we have a white woman as a president? Why can't we have a white woman that's driving the engine of change in the United States? Because we go all the way back to our earlier assumptions about women. We're emotionally unstable. You know, we are, you know, catty and whatever else they want to say about us. So although black women may get the bottom end of that, white women get the top end of it, right? So you struggle to find your, your space. And so then when you add to the mixture, brown, black, educated or not, whatever, it's a different kind of struggle, you know? So when we look at the world, and, and I can only speak for myself, but from what I've heard from others, when we look at the world, we're looking at the world trying to find our way in. Can we, can we participate? Can we participate in the capitalistic society? Can we be professors and doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs and partners and all those things? Or are we still scratching to get out of the dust? You know, and so in, in my mind, you know, I, I, everything you all have said here is tremendously wonderful. I mean, the, the submarine way is a beautiful name. I love the fact that you've got these five components that address these things. But, but I would just say, and, and just for me, how, how do I get to the place where I feel like I belong in this society that I am a contributor. If I, so I, I wanna be a CIO. I've been asking to do this thing for years. And I can't tell you how many people who care about me have said, I'm not smart enough, or I haven't done this long enough. I've been in IT since 1977, however many years that is, but I'm not smart enough. I have never not been successful, never had a negative performance evaluation. I've had my position eliminated twice, but I've never been fired. But yet still, I'm not qualified to have that job. Why am I not? What is it about me that makes me not? My work speaks for itself. You know, I, I am collaborative to the nth degree. You know, I've done everything I can to bring people together. And yet still, I'm not qualified. Why am I not qualified? I mean, I, I can't answer that question. Um, 
I would think an industry somewhere would be able to appreciate your talents and, and what you have might not be the company that you're in now. And I've, I've coached a lot of women and I, I suggest to them that they keep on looking. Oh, you might be looking in the wrong places. Um, and if you can't get what you want, if you can't, you can't contribute in the way that you, you want to or you need to, you might have to go out on your own and do it yourself and start your own company. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with you, but I'm not, I wasn't asking that question for me. I was asking that question for all the people that are standing in that line trying to find their way. And I'm sure you both know where the economic status is of many people. I mean, with the pandemic is one thing, but just in general, black and brown people struggle economically in this country, you know, obtaining right. wealth, keeping wealth, you know, leaving a legacy to their children. That's, that's an ongoing struggle. So when I asked you, why can't I, I'm really, you know, more of a, a figuratively, why can't I, okay. you know, what, what's, what's, what's the barrier that's holding back that, that uh, a Fortune 500 company or a nonprofit wouldn't hire uh, a, a qualified person of color or a person, a gender or religion or whatever. It's why are these things still barricades to the top? Well, I, I think it goes back to what we talked about, but I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll focus on what I would do if I were coaching someone who, who expressed that to me and expressed frustration and not being able to move. We would, uh, we would help that person figure out what their unique talents were and maybe what they're imagining needs, needs a little adjustment. Maybe what they're imagining their talents actually are, are just as powerful and just as important but they're not exactly where they're pointed. And we would work with them and, and coach them on how they find the right avenue and the right industry for them to get into where they can, where they can make an impact. Because there are plenty of people who have made an impact. I mean, you've, you've made a tremendous impact and you've, you've carved, carved out a way for yourself that is very, very unique and very cool. And those opportunities are out there. And that's, that's how we would coach someone. You know, you made a comment about, about white privilege. I, I absolutely think it exists. But I think with all of us, it's really hard to know how that manifests itself. Yeah. Because I can tell you as a woman in very male dominated industries in the, in the 90s in insurance industry, working with independent agents, uh, where women were not welcome, I sure did not feel privileged at all. I felt like I was scrapping every single moment of the day to try to get anywhere. Um, but I, to your point, I do think it exists. It's just really hard to know how it manifests itself. And I don't spend a lot of time thinking about that because I want to spend time thinking about people I can make a difference with. Uh, and if I can use this privilege, whatever that is, um, like I said, I think it exists. I just don't know how it manifests itself. But if I can use that to help somebody else, then I'm going to use that to help somebody else. And I, like you, have really focused a lot on helping women because I did eventually scrap my way to an executive role in the corporate world. And I wanted to make sure that I pulled every woman forward that I possibly could. And I helped them know how I did it and I wanted to set them up for success. So that's how I use my white privilege is to really help others. I think I also think I also think the macro here is important. And what I mean by the macro is again, we're talking about changing norms that have existed forever. Yeah. And the way they change, and this is frustrating and I don't want anyone to be patient. Like nothing annoys me more than wait just wait, just wait, wait your turn, wait your, that, that's so condescending and patronizing. But the reality is, is when someone sees you achieve whatever level, which is probably a level or two higher than any uh, a woman of color has before, other people look and go, huh. And I'm not talking about aspirationally, like a young woman sees that. I'm talking about the white guy in charge goes, oh, wow, she's pretty good at that. And it shouldn't be that way. And it shouldn't be, but then the next time, Two years from now, all of a sudden, that's not such a nutty thought. Right. So maybe this level. 
And I, and I get it, it's frustrating, it's not fair, it's not right, it's not reasonable, but that little incremental move of pushing the needle. The other thing I think is directly to Deb's point. I think there are companies, we don't do a lot of work in the Fortune 500 space, it's sort of next level down, but there are some companies that could care less who you are. They are all about results, expertise, and they are wildly inclusive. And I'm not saying that that's a panacea and gee, just find one of those companies. But there is a movement towards getting away from the usual suspects. But I completely get it at a DNA level that if I'm in, in if I'm not a white guy, that yeah, thanks, pal. Thanks for the thanks for the uplifting advice. It's fallen a little shallow here because you're telling me it's three years, it's five years, it's 10 years. No, I'm telling you, don't be satisfied with three or five years. Go as far as you can go and then one step further. And then perhaps the person behind you gets to piggyback on you. And it's not the ideal answer, but at least it's honest. Well, I'm going to tell you something. That's exactly my philosophy. So one of the pieces that I have, so I have a small little company that de deals with uh, digital diversity. And so I often tell people, you know, reach for the moon and catch a star, you know, just get as far as you can and catch a star because sooner or later, either that star is going to burn out or you're going to move on. But one of the things I noticed about human nature, we are risk averse, right? So if I'm in this senior level position, what's my likelihood, especially my age group. Now, I don't know about these younger people because I hear millennium millennials or something altogether different. I don't know if that's correct or not, but, but in my level, you know, I'm comfortable, I'm safe, I've, I've got fairly a stable job, so why am I gonna step out there? But when I started my company, the thing that I found specifically, and this was true for every woman I talked to, was how little value they saw in themselves. And whether that's something they learned at home, whether they learned that in the workplace, like to go in and negotiate for a raise. So they say, we're gonna pay you $50,000 a year. Why? Can I have 60? But we are so uncomfortable with that conversation that we don't go there. Or, you know, there's a job that's a stretch. You don't go to that job because you're afraid you're gonna fail. And I tell people all the time, fail as often as you can. I mean, fall down, because if you take the simple thing of a baby learning to walk or a child learning to ride a, ride a bicycle, they fall a lot, but eventually those falls and failures and setbacks turn into yep. productivity. You're able to walk, you're able to ride a bicycle, whatever it is. And so in your career, you know, someone told me, um, they, they talked about Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton and him and his affair. Like if Obama had had that same thing happen to him, he would not have recovered as Clinton had. And that's an interesting analogy, you know, because I do understand it. It makes perfectly good sense. But Obama had to be literally almost a spotless president. So when his his pastor made those comments, comments that he made, or somebody else made those comments, it was quick to condemn him, you know. And there are still people challenging whether he's born in America, whether he's American. I mean, all of this exists for what purpose? In order to make sure that we do not have people that don't look like the, the norm advancing. I mean, we had a black president for four, eight years. And as far as I can tell now, I don't know how you measure results. He didn't have any scandals. He didn't have any terminations. He wasn't firing people. There weren't all this other stuff going on that seems to be happening in this current administration, but that was not good enough. And so for me, and I'm, now I'm really literally speaking for me, my reach level is not very high because I'm not trying to have that scorn put upon me, you know? And I have, have, have a tremendous community that's just so wonderful to me, but I always find myself leery of what it is that I'm hearing, you know? So what is it that you're saying to me? You know, so when we had the conversations about Mr. Floyd, or we had the conversations about the black man in Rochester who's having a mental health break, an obvious mental health, because anybody in cold weather in Rochester naked is something is wrong with them. I, you know, that's just one of them real serious things. And then we had last week a social worker where the police went into the wrong house. She's yeah. naked and they go handcuffed her naked. I mean, like something about that is uncomfortable in a way that's not easy, easily patched over, you know, because like that could happen to any of us. And John, I'll go back to your comment about, you know, law enforcement. So when I'm driving in my car, 
there is nothing out of place, nothing. When my son leaves to go to college and come back, 10 and two, put your driver's license and your registration on your visor. So you could just pull up there or let him pull it out so you can come home. So you make it home safely because my son is a black man in a society that sees him either as a threat or inferior or something. So his life could be taken just like that because of some action that somebody else believes about him. And those kinds of challenges, you know, in, in my, my day job and in my, my, my company and in these chats, I'm trying to get people to hear something that may make it click for them so that they would do that, that big stretch, that these young people that are coming behind or whoever it is, will listen to one of these chats like ours and hear all these wonderful things that you guys have said. I said, maybe this is possible for me. Maybe I could do this. Maybe I need a coach, you know, whatever it is. But to say, hey, because more times than not, they don't know what to do. They are assuming that the box that they've been put in is the only box available to them. You know, so how do you get out of that box? And, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this last analogy, you know, slavery did not end because uh, we had the Underground Railroad. Slavery ended because white people saw value in getting rid of slavery. They didn't think the economic wealth of the South was fair. Now, whether that's states' rights or not, I don't know. But I don't believe we make any moves without collaboration from people who look like us, people who do not look like us, people who have commonalities and people who do not. I don't think it happens because I'm a black woman shouting, hey, stop doing that. It's gonna take you, Deb and John, you know, shouting with me to say, stop doing that. You know, you guys are gonna to have to put some skin in the game. You know, you're gonna to have to take a risk. You know, you're gonna to have to, you know, recommend that they hire um, whoever and, and give her a chance. And she might be a bust. But you still got to put that spin in the, that skin in the game. You got to keep doing it until you're able to make change. I think the difference in my skin in the game and your skin in the game when I make a mistake is held to a higher standard when I when I fail. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I love this conversation. I love what you're doing. So you guys have books. Can you tell us a little bit about the book? Is, is it two books or one book? Can you talk about that a little bit? Two, two. Can you tell us a little bit about the books? Sure. Um, the first book that actually literally launched the company was after that keynote speech and the overwhelming response we got from a predominantly um, audience of color. Uh, and that was diversity and inclusion the submarine way. Um, mm -hmm. Deb, Deb uh, literally quit her dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have it for a prop. It's that we use it all the time. So yeah, we use it all the time. <laughs> I have it on the desk. And, and, and that book just, just breaks it down again, more as a business strategy. Uh, more as how can you really use this to make a difference? How can you start valuing people for who they are, not what they look like or where they're from? Not aspirationally, right. not pie in the sky, real stuff that you can really do. There's two types of people in the world and this gets me in trouble all the time and I don't really care. And, and I'm, I'm being just for brevity's sake, there's a, we're all a blend, but people are motivated by it's the right thing to do Yes. People are motivated by the bottom line. Yep. Now I go, I'm, I'm putting people in pigeonholes and you should never do that. But basically those are the two things. Well, how about this? What if we had an approach that appeals to both? Right. It's altruistic and the right thing to do, but it also drives the bottom line. You've got everybody covered there. And that's what diversity and inclusion in the submarine way is. It's a business approach to equity, inclusion, and diversity. And then the second book is Up Periscope, uh, which was just released uh, in May. And very interestingly enough, that was a book that was asked for by our clients. They said, can you write a pure leadership book through the lens of inclusion, which is <laughs> over my shoulder, leadership development through inclusion. We love this idea that inclusion isn't something you do mandatory training. It's actually a leadership strategy. What a crazy idea, valuing people for what they bring to the table. So that was a book that was requested by our clients that, that Deb wrote. She wrote both of our books. My name's on the cover. That's my 97 year old. credit, huh? My 97 year old mom said, I love the book. Why is your name second? <laughs> and I said, I said, Mom, literally 97 year old Portuguese lady, I said, Mom, Deb wrote every word except for the one paragraph preface. And she said, Who spent all those years on submarines? <laughs> so I wasn't winning that one. But the second book, which, okay. which uh, is, is, is very much a business book geared toward leadership development, but it's through the same principle. So those are the two books. So Periscope, um, putting traditional leadership in the crosshairs, 
And the first book is diversity and inclusion of the submarine. And this, the second idea is to, or the second book is to get leaders, tap into leaders and develop leaders as early as possible. Yeah. That same idea of you can get to someone in elementary school or you can get to their teacher, you can get to someone. Um, so get getting to leaders as early as possible and building that inclusive mindset. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, um, I, the, are both of the books on, uh, for sale somewhere or Amazon or wherever you yeah, can Am and all over. All yeah, over. Amazon's yeah. the easiest place to, uh, to, get, to get both of the books. So uh, please send me the links to uh, sure. where you can get both the books so I can put it on your, your chat, you know, if you approve to have this chat. Yeah, going, I, I don't know where to get the chat. So let me ask my last question. So the submarine way is a philosophy that you all have developed and you apply that to companies and, and individuals you interact with. What's the best thing about it? And what's the, I wouldn't say worst, but what's, how about the strengths and weaknesses of the approach? Mm -hmm. That's cool. That is cool. Um, I would say the, the, the strengths are, it's tangible tools to create change. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about that, about the need for going beyond just words or going beyond philosophies or theories to actually tangible tools. So I would say that's the best. That's the, the strength. You yeah. probably have some other ideas. I think the weakness is that in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, there are lots of other theories out there. And it's getting people to understand that this is a tangible tool and that it really works and getting them to embrace it, to, to actually see that it drives change, that it 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 whatever the industry is, if it's a business, it dri drives ROI. If it's law enforcement, it opens up minds, it changes behavior, and it's getting people to go beyond that because it's a, it's a different way of looking at that topic. So mm -hmm. I would say that that's probably, I don't know if it's a weakness, but that's the difficulty of, of that idea. Yeah. What would you say? I, I would just, I, I, I would echo a, a, what Deb said. The strength of it is it's practical and it's applicable. You can actually use this. And you can use it for someone on the loading dock and someone in the C-suite. I mean, it's, uh, and, and, if, and the weakness of it is it makes people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. This is not, you know, this is not mom and dad's diversity. This isn't let's all feel good and pretend everything's fine tomorrow. It's like, no, it's not going to be fine until we do things differently. We have to look at people differently. We have to have uncomfortable conversations. We have to be willing. And quite frankly, there's a lot of folks that are like, yeah, not for us, man. So from a business point of view, it's a tough business model. Yes, it is. Because people are like, wow, this might make some people uncomfortable. This, yes, that's how we change. So power, power sharing, right? So um, I've got all the power. Why am I going to share it with you? Why, why would I why would I share my power with you? Why right. it's like if I have a million dollars, why would I give you any? I mean, like what's what's the actuality that you can get from that? So how do we break that mold of not willing to share or to um, see other people having value and have access to the same things that I have access to. Is that incorporated in the submarine way? It's actually a basic tenant, which again, and it falls into those two categories. You have someone with a million dollars that says, you know what, I don't need a million, I'm fine on half a million. What's the best way for me to get rid of half a million dollars and help others? Very altruistic. Right. There's the other person that says, man, I got a million bucks, this is my million bucks, and say, you know what, what if by helping other people, here's a crazy notion, by rising other people up, by helping other people up, you can turn that million bucks into two million bucks. That's a good point. Very, very people, good. People are like, oh, how offensive. You're, 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 you're helping the wealthy guy get wealthy. Wait a minute. If it's helping 500 people rise up, whatever, because you're never going to make the altruistic appeal to that person. You're never going to go, oh, it's the right thing to do. But you can, hey, I can double my money. I can be 20% more profitable. I can... Okay, but if it rises people up, okay, fine. So the wealth rich guy gets richer. You, you know that that's that's how you have to approach it. You because have to be practical about recruiting this. Recruiting talent is difficult. Exactly, for, and especially if you're narrowing it to a, a certain type of people, open up the idea of who is a potential talent, and yeah. recruiting becomes a lot less difficult. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, one of the talks I gave uh, to a, a Fortune 500 company not too long ago is like. When you're hiring for a senior leader, if everybody in that room is exactly that, a senior leader, you might get a black or a brown person, but you're not really gonna get a diverse outcome because you need to bring that girl or guy who's just starting out in your organization. You need to bring somebody from another department into that interview because that's where you get diversity. Because now 
you know, all the C-suite level managers, you know, they, they, they have their experience. They probably forgot half of what these younger people or people from other departments have. And you bring in these new ideas. You challenge the status quo, right? So the guy that just started, an accountant, you know, he's not the top CPA or whatever. So you just started and you bring him into the interview when you get ready to hire a senior accountant, you're going to get a view that's so different from that person that is a senior accountant because they haven't, had, they haven't had all that baggage. They haven't learned all those, you know, gotchas, you know, that they're still learning. And then people from another department. So if you bring someone from the HR department or whatever department over to this interview, you're also going to get another lens on, on, on this, this, this hiring, which means you absolutely do get a diverse candidate. I would just add that one little piece is that if you're only looking for a person to hire, and through search, firm, search firms, these large conglomerate search firms that only work with a top 1% or 5% or whatever it is, you're gonna have so much sameness that you're never gonna get out of that because the criteria they set says, here's what this company wants and I wanna make sure I make money from this company. So I'm gonna only put in front of them these yep. kinds of people. So yep. you've got to break that mold as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. If, if if there's only, a, I'm not a fisherman, so this is going to, someone, someone's going to watch us and go, man, that, that dude's making a, <laughs> but if you only have striped bass and say, hey, I'm open to all kinds of fish, but there's only striped bass in the pond, you go, you know what, I'm open to everybody, but there's only striped bass in my pond. That's because there's only striped bass in your pond. Right. Absolutely. You, you, you know, find another pond or introduce another fish. I'm, I'm out of my level here, but you, you, know, <laughs> but, you know, it's sort of like, hey, don't blame me. There's only striped bass. Come on. Absolutely. Come on. So I want to thank you both so much for chatting with me. We have, we've gone over a little bit of our time, but I'd like to give you five or 10 minutes to say whatever you want to say, talk about your company, uh, anything that this, this chat can do to help or to further your cause. Okay. Um, we work with uh, typically medium-sized businesses, yeah. but we definitely have worked with some larger organizations too, but medium-sized businesses, we work with communities, universities, uh, we work with school systems, so we've done quite a bit of training with either teachers, yeah. but we've also worked with bus drivers. We, we, we did a program with bus drivers where uh, we help them to sort of have a better sense of community with the, with the students who rode their buses with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we help them also build their self-esteem, you know, in, in, in the positions that they had. So we work with all kinds of groups of people. In fact, we, we typically say, if it's a person and, and we can influence their behavior, then there's someone who we, uh, we can work with. We also do uh, coaching and um, we will probably write a third book. I don't know <laughs> yeah. when that will be, but I- She'll get the itch in another year or so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we have two programs. One of them is called Core Compass One. One of them is called Core Compass Two. And there's actually other single programs out there. But those are the leadership through inclusion uh, mm -hmm. programs that that we have. So I'm sure I probably missed something. No, it, it's it's very much a holistic model. Uh, our whole approach is we're not transactional. We're transformational. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want a weekend workshop, you know, we can do it. Just not going to change anything. Um, we've talked about, and this has been a, a, an amazing, thank you for, for having us. This has Absolutely. been an amazing discussion because the big takeaway here is none of this stuff changes tomorrow morning. And anyone who's selling you that is selling you snake oil. Right. So when we go into an organization, we're not there for six months or nine months because you know we want an office. We're there for six months or nine months or sometimes a year because that's what it takes to start really changing mindset and changing behavior and helping them go, you know what? Maybe our city manager can be black. What a crazy idea. Um, you can't go in and say that on Monday and then on Tuesday, people are going, yeah, we're open to it. No, you're not, you're lying to me. Yeah. So it's that long-term approach. It's the fact that we do a lot of pre-work that we actually learn organizations. It's that we have this wild reinforcement. Here's a crazy idea. You do a three hour workshop, you should have at least two, three, four touch points where people start practicing what they learn Absolutely. before you ever do another workshop. Absolutely. You don't reinforce it, learning decay kills you. And 90% of what you learn is gone in 30 days because we're busy people. Absolutely. And when you're talking about something as important as equity and inclusion and how to lead with that mindset, that's going to take some time and yeah. reinforcement. And you're going to have to play with one, it. And one we of the love things we, we the talk, transformations. We talk about a lot is 
that we typically don't work with communities or law enforcement or businesses that are train wrecks. Yeah, that's a good point. We, we work with those that are good and they want to be great. Yeah. And so they they're willing to invest the time that it takes to be great. And we're willing to invest in them to, to be great. So yeah, that's a um, good point. Yeah, yeah. Organizations that are completely closed to anything other than the way they've done it since 1842, yes. they don't hire us <laughs> because they're not going to like what we're bringing to the table. It tends to be people that are either curious or are already trying, but they don't quite have the expertise and the structure to put it in place. So that's a, that's, that's a really good point. But mostly we're just blessed that we have the opportunity um, to really, really see organizations function differently, to, to really see them truly embracing the uniqueness of people and valuing a person for what that person brings to the table, not where they're from, what they sound like, all that other stuff. And it's, it's great to know it's possible because we see it time and time again in our work. And when you actually see that change, it's, it's mind blowing. It yeah, really it is, absolutely. I have a suggestion for you, uh, something you just touched on, John. So, um, you know, you, you know, when you do something, you don't go back and reinforce it. One of the things I've always had a problem with is these uh, digital courses or, you know, one shot co courses. So there's something called Black Girls Code and there's Code Plus. And, you know, the Girl Scouts has a, a coding thing, you know, where girls come in badges and things. And the problem with me, for the, the problem for me with those things are, Where's the reinforcement? Because as you said, 30 days from now, I don't remember. And I can tell you, I, I used to have a photographic memory. I don't have that anymore. I barely remember what my name is most of the <laughs> But, um, you know, that if you don't reinforce what you're teaching over and over and over again. So let's just say I came and I said, Deb, I want to I want to take some of your coaching. And so you give me some ideas, you spend some time with me and whatever it is, and I don't ever hear from you again. And I have not applied what you taught me or not even imbibed it. I haven't digested it. I haven't put it in my mindset. You just made some money, but the person who went through that process probably didn't make very much progress. So it's, it's often needed to be reaffirmed to constantly, you know, check in, you know, so what, what little bit of work I do on the side is that's my, my, my whole thing. It's like, no matter what it is I give you, I'm coming back to visit you over and over again. How is this working? What do we need to do different? You know, to just make hay with you, you know, where, where are we doing? So I think that's a beautiful point. I think that's really something that needs to be emphasized over and over again. You can't just give somebody one serving of fried chicken and say, hey, you got chicken forever. No, I just had some this time. I'd like to have some tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So I think that's a beautiful thing that you just said. And, and that's really wonderful. I, I wish you all the very, very best. And if I can help you in any way, you know where to find me. But uh, I think what you Same guys- Same here in reverse. We can help you in any way. Yeah. You know where to find us. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting us. This was great. This was great. Absolutely. I think you both are spectacular people with a very, very good lens on the condition of our social justice. And that's really important to have. And there is a lot of work to do. So I expect you all to be gazillionaires before you stop working because you've got a lot of work out there to do. You know, and I think when some of those Fortune 500 companies start to realize the value of what you guys are talking about, you know, you'll even have those guys knocking at your door trying to get the business because I think if we don't change human behaviors, they're making difference what, what else we do. You know, we can write all the policies, create all the amendments we want to, but if people aren't practicing it and don't buy right. it, we're just wasting our time. Yeah. So thank, thank you both for this. Yeah. I'm going to end this chat, but don't leave me. So, <laughs> and, and, and I will send you, I will send you a link once it's converted. So you both can see it and look at it.